My father was born March 23rd, 1919, in a small Slovak town in a Jewish family. His father was a lawyer and his mother was a housewife. He had one older sister, Eva. In 1937, he started his medical study in Prague. After the occupation of uh, Germany, he had to move to uh, Slovakia, where the independent pro-Nazi Slovak state was established. When he came back uh, to Slovakia, he had to join the army, but actually it was no army, it was a detention camp where young Jews and gypsies had to work very hard. He succeeded to escape the detention camp and then he left Slovakia uh, in the small height in the railway car loaded with wood. The journey to Switzerland lasted for 12 days. In uh, Switzerland he started to study again medicine in Bern. But after two years, when the France was liberated, he moved to Paris because he wanted to join the army, the Czechoslovakian army in Great Britain. But strange enough, he was not recruited. He studied medicine in Paris and he finished his study in 1946. After his graduation, he worked for a shorter period of time at the Department of Neurology at Salpetriere. The head of the department was Professor Guillain and the head of the ward was Professor Molaret. At the end of 1936, he decided to go back to the Czechoslovakia. 41 members of the broader family was murdered in concentration camps and just three people survived the war. His mother was murdered uh, in the death march from Auschwitz and the sister died in a completely unknown place. He started his career in neurology in Hradec Králové. That's the biggest city east of Prague. In 1949, he came to Prague to work at the Department of Neurology at Charles University. And he stood here for the, his whole life. This is the place where I am working now as neurologist. My father was a quiet, kind and honest man uh, with full respect to social dignity, to, uh, to democratic principles. And I think he inspired many people during his life. He was not only an excellent uh, teacher and excellent researcher, but uh, he was a very good father. And uh, I must say I loved him and I miss him up till now. I am really pleased and honored that I can present here uh, a few data about Professor Roth's life and work. Uh, he was my best teacher, uh, one of my best friends and of course my best co-worker. When he came at uh, Hennel's neurological clinic, he started collecting patients suffering from excessive daytime sleepiness, from narcolepsy and from hypersomnia. Some of these patients from the early uh, 1950s uh, come to our clinic, visit us up to present time. The first uh, sleep registrations were done only by EEG, not by polysomnography, of course, it was later. Uh, however, from the clinical point of view, he distinguished since the beginning the differences between narcolepsy and with, between, as he called, sleep drunkenness. One of his best uh, papers came from uh, 1956 and in this paper he very precisely correlated these two clinical units. For example, uh, narcolepsy with imperative daytime sleepiness, uh, with short duration, with typical cataplexy, sleep paralysis and other sleep dissociated of sleep uh, disorders. Uh, he correlated also the differences between nocturnal falling asleep, nocturnal sleep, awakening from nocturnal sleep and uh, some other, for, of course, EEG changes. Uh, 
in 1957, he published his fir first monograph. It was published, of course, in Czech. And the name of this monograph was Narcolepsy and Hypersomnia in Terms of Sleep Physiology. In this monograph, he uh, studied uh, 104 patients suffering from narcolepsy and 93 patients uh, with hypersomnia. Uh, from the narcoleptic patient, uh, 70 were typical with typical cataplexy. He recognized uh, very detail the cataplectic attacks, not only cataplexy uh, that affect the whole body, but also cataplexy only with partial affection, for example, uh, in eyelids, in soft palate with rhinolalia, in muscle, um, chin or sh shoulder, uh, arms, and so on. Uh, these partial uh, attacks were very detailed described, also usually was evoked by emotion, usually by laughter, but sometimes cataplexy appeared also without any emotion. Uh, sometimes after some uh, strong movement or very rarely without any um, cause. What was very important also was that consciousness was maintained and uh, he also find that, for example, some attacks of cataplexy were evoked also or were con connected also by brief um, movements. Uh, some of these uh, cataplectic attacks well, were evoked by brief hyperkinesia. And it is very, very rare for the time 55 years ago to describe this feature of cataplectic attacks. In this monograph also, um, Professor Roth very detailed uh, described other, um, other um, states of diso sleep dissociated, for example, sleep paralysis, uh, hypnagogic hallucination or states of automatic behavior. Uh, the second part of this monograph was devoted to hypersomnia. Uh, hypersomnia was uh, divided into three uh, parts, into functional, into uh, organic, uh, there were hypersomnia after some brain damage, and the most um, interesting uh, group of this was um, were patients suffering from uh, so-called sleep drunkenness or post-dormital drunkenness, it was his uh, term. The first polygraphic uh, recordings were done in uh, 1962. Uh, it was used, he used uh, the channel not only for EEG, but also channel for breathing, uh, breathing movements. And three years later, in 1965, uh, the typical polysomnographic recordings with uh, muscle channels, with eye movements, were added. One of the first polysomnographic uh, uh, papers uh, was devoted to narcolepsy, hypersomnia, and dreams. He collected 75 patients suffering from um, these disorders, and uh, we recorded afternoon um, afternoon or daytime recordings, afternoon recordings, in which the patients were repeatedly uh, awakened. Most of the patients uh, were monitored with narcolepsy, but some also for f with hypersomnia. And uh, we distinguished also from which states, which type of dream were found. Uh, we found that in REM phase or so-called uh, partial REM phase, uh, it was something between REM and between non-REM sleep, according to Professor Roth. Uh, all, uh, almost all dreams were really vivid, sometimes horrified. But uh, during non-REM sleep, we found much more frequently uh, only vague dream or no dream. One of the major line of Professor Roth was um, work devoted to uh, idiopathic hypersom hypersomnia with sleep drunkenness. One of the best uh, papers was published in 1972, and it was a uh, paper together with Alan Rechtschaffen. Uh, 
In this paper, uh, 58 patients suffering from idiopathic hypersomnia with sleep drunkenness were examined. Uh, most of these patients came from Prague and uh, it was a very clear uh, description of uh, sleep drunkenness. A hypersomnia with sleep drunkenness uh, was characterized by prolonged uh, awakening, not only from the deep um, nocturnal sleep, but also from the daytime sleep. Uh, the patients uh, had a poor motor co coordination, slowness, and ten they tend uh, repeatedly uh, to dozing off. Uh, the nocturnal sleep was quite normal, but much more prolonged. For example, we can see that uh, the patients spent 11 up to 12 uh, uh, cycles of non-REM and REM sleep, and it, depend it, uh, it lasted maybe uh, 15, 16 hours uh, uninterrupted sleep. In 1975, uh, Professor Roth and myself published a paper devoted to depression in narcolepsy and in hypersomnia. Uh, the patients were, devoted, were divided uh, between um, idiopathic and between symptomatic or secondary cases. And it was a very interesting that patients with, um, with idiopathic form, uh, narcoleptic as well as hypersomniac patients, had both a um, very high frequency of depression. Uh, on, co on the contrary, the patients uh, with symptomatic form, they have no depression in history or at the present time. In the 1970s and 1980s, Professor Rod had the, had the largest material of patients suffering from excessive daytime sleepiness, from narcolepsy and for, from uh, hypersomnia from the whole world. His best uh, monograph, Narcolepsy and Hypersomnia, uh, was published in, uh, in 1980. And I can to say that it was a Bible, f not for the um, physician, but also for the patients for uh, many, many years. In this uh, monograph, he described 620 patients who op were observed by him for a period of uh, 26 years. There were a group of uh, 360 uh, narcoleptics and 260 hypersomniac patients. Uh, the narcoleptic patients were divided into idiopathic and symptomatic again, and he divided these patients between so-called uh, monosymptomatic and polysymptomatic cases. The monosymptomatic case, does it mean that was narcolepsy is isolated without cataplexy or without any sleep paralysis and so on. And um, also he found some cases with isolated uh, cataplexy and with isolated sleep paralysis. And the polysymptomatic cases, there were cases narcolepsy with cataplexy and with other uh, dissociated sleep uh, dissociated sleep disorders like hypnagogic hallucination and so on. Also, the hypersomniac patients were divided into idiopathic and into symptomatic cases, and he divided um, these patients between so-called short. A cycle and long cycle. The short cycle, it, does, it, does it mean that it is uh, patients with circadian rhythmicity? And the long cycle, there are periodic hypersomnia. Uh, the short cycle hypersomniacs were also divided between monosymptomatic and polysymptomatic. The monosymptomatic patient, there were only patients suffering from daytime sleepiness. But the polysymptomatic, they were patients suffering also with very prolonged nocturnal sleep, with sleep drunkenness. And what is very important, um, the sleep during the day was long, much more longer than in narcolepsy. It can last hours and hours. And also the um, awakening from this daytime sleep was very long.
In a similar way, also the patients suffering from long cycle hypersomnia were divided into monosymptomatic and polysymptomatic. The monosymptomatic, it doesn't mean that only the sleep appeared uh, for several days, maybe once in two, three months or so on. Uh, the polysymptomatic, it does mean that it is uh, uh, Klein-Levin syndrome, uh, then in which in in which the sleepiness was accompanied also uh, some with some other symptoms with bulimia, with polydipsia, with some psychiatric disorders and so on. In this monograph, Professor Roth also described menstrual hypersomnia, and the menstrual hypersomnia is periodic hypersomnia that appears in the last uh, classification. Uh, Professor Roth was also engaged in some multicentric or in some multi-ethnic studies. Uh, there were studies with Professor Hishikawa and Professor Broughton with uh, Asian, North American and European population. These studies were devoted to uh, quality of life, life of patients suffering from narcolepsy and hypersomnia, uh, to uh, quality of education, uh, to the employment, to the uh, difficulties with uh, driving licenses, uh, maybe accidents, with uh, difficulties with recre recreation and so on. Uh, the next paper with the same authors uh, was devoted to the same topic, but it was oriented much, much more clinically to the sex of the patient, to the age at onset, onset uh, to the clinical, uh, clinical features of narcolepsy uh, and hypersomnia. One of the last articles of Professor Roth was devoted to HLA. This paper was uh, done together with Munich uh, group and uh, 124 patients uh, were uh, collected. There were only narcoleptic patients and uh, almost all were HLE uh, positive. Only four patients were negative and there were two patients suffering from narcolepsy cataplexy and two patients suffering only from isolated narcolepsy. And in this uh, paper, it, I can say that it was um, some background of the uh, modern concept of uh, immunogenetic um, etiology of narcolepsy, and it was done also in this paper. Professor Roth died in uh, 1989, just a few days before the Velvet Revolution here in Prague. In memory to his uh, unattained 90th birthday, uh, was organized in Prague in um, two, uh, 2009 International Symposium uh, devoted to narcolepsy and hypersomnia. And his best friends like Broger Broughton and uh, Michel Briard accepted our invitation and came. Also, well-known scientists, as for example, Professor Mignot or Professor Polmacher or Professor Bassetti came. And um, I can say that this symposium was very successful.